Tired of your drinking options and boring beer? Well, The Drop is creating a middle space between beer and wine. And on this episode of Ambition Today, we're joined by the one and only Alexis Beechin. She's the co-founder and CEO of The Drop, and she's pioneering the canned wine industry. These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? I am Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to Ambition Today. Welcome to a new episode of Season 3. We're coming to you from the heart of the Meatpacking District in New York City, In case you missed it, last episode we talked to Dan Nelson. He's the founder of Grow Computer. And today we're joined by the amazing Alexis Beechin, who's the co-founder and CEO of The Drop Wine. Alexis, welcome to Ambition Today. Thank you so much for having me. So where are we today? Let's set the scene for, for the audience. Cool. So we are in a WeWork space in fancy meatpacking. Uh, this is where <laughs> I uh, work out of, and uh, it's good to see you. We've known each other for a while, so I'm thrilled to be a guest here. Yeah, long time uh, at this point, long time FI New York mentor, and I have some amazing sessions with the founders, so it's been, it's been great to know you, and, and let's jump into it. Cool. All right. Uh, so taking it back, do you remember how you made your first dollar? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, hmm, I think the the kind of the first time that I felt like I was a businesswoman was I, uh, my mom was throwing away some of her old clothes and uh, I convinced her rather than just donating them, let me try to sell them on consignment. And so I convinced her and some of her friends to work out some sort of you know, uh, revenue share. I don't quite know. I don't think it was very <laughs> fancy at the time, but um, I made business cards for myself. Um, I think my business was called like Foxy Girl Consignment Clothing, nice. and I was going up. I lived. I grew up in Los Angeles, so I was going up and down Ventura Boulevard to all these cool consignment stores, um, trying to make some money and figure out how to make a business. So that how, was how old do you think first. you were? I was driving, so I must have been like sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Do you ever watch that um, The Girl Boss show? It's based on the real story of thegirlboss.com. But yeah. The, the show on Netflix is pretty good. It's similar. similar I, I wish I was as, as successful as Sophia. <laughs> I wasn't, didn't quite get there, but I think we had the same insight. Nice. So fast forwarding a little bit, what is the worst job you've ever had? Ooh, good question. I think the one that I felt kind of the least engaged in was I was a a smoothie creator at this place called Robux, which is like a Jamba Juice knockoff. And it was a perfectly acceptable job, but I don't think they did a very good job of creating buy-in and and great culture. So it definitely didn't feel like I was learning a lot or growing as a professional. It just felt like a a very nine-to-five, just clock in, clock out job. Nice. So when you look back at sort of that time in your life, right, you mentioned you grew up in L.A., um, talk to me about like your, your parents, grandparents, uncles, like, you know, where do you think you kind of got like the bug, the entrepreneur bug from? That's a good question. So both my parents were lawyers. Okay. Um, and, but both of them were kind of entrepreneurs in their own right. My dad, um, had his own small firm. So he was very much in charge of bringing in new business, making sure that, you know, everything from the most important uh, legal matters to making sure that the bookkeeping got done. That was all his job. And then my mom took a very different role in law and worked at a really big law firm. But, you know, really, I think she was the first person who taught me about branding and branding yourself, not just, um, you know, the company that you work for, but needing to create a brand for yourself, you need to establish trust. And they both were hustlers in their own right. Um, and I remember my mom telling me, you know, wanting to try to push me into business um, yeah. you know, and, and trying to explain that, you know, law is amazing, but you can only make as much money as uh, the hours you build. It's so, it's so funny because like you would normally get the like the the parents that weren't that successful being like you need to do better and then you have like the lawyers being like you need to do even better. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't about me doing better. I mean, they they were like every um, parent wants the best for their they kids. want the yeah. best for their kids. Yeah. But I think it was more about trying to explain the idea of flexibility and the idea of building something and yeah. then you know letting your hard work pay yeah. off. Um, so that always kind of so maybe even like some early lessons age. around like ownership or equity or exactly yeah. exactly and then and then just the idea of of you know if you see something if you're passionate about something do that and then you know enjoy kind of the fruits of that labor yeah that's awesome yeah so what did you so let's let's get into the college years what did you go to school for what did you study did you go to school 
Yep. Uh, I, I went to school. I went to Georgetown uh, University and, and went into the undergrad business program. Uh, I was really passionate about marketing from a young age. I immediately, or as soon as I kind of understood what marketing and advertising was, I was really excited about this idea of like left brain, right brain working together, you know, using creativity to solve a business problem. So I was pretty focused on wanting to go into advertising um, after school. So Georgian had a great uh, undergrad marketing program. So I, I did that and then moved to New York uh, without a job. Thank you to my parents for, for believing in me a little <laughs> bit and found um, an apartment and a got a job offer the last day I'd given myself to figure it out in New York. It's so it's so funny how that works. Yeah. I, had, I had moved to New York, sold my car. I was literally down to like twenty dollars in my account. Yeah. And uh, I got a job offer like the, yeah like that week. Um, it's amazing how that works out. It yeah. makes you think that like okay, this is my path. This is what I'm meant to do. Well, and I also think moving to New York. Maybe it's moving everywhere, but moving to New York just seems so hard, uh, unnecessarily rough. Yes, I think that it certainly weeds out those people that aren't really willing to do whatever it takes to make it work. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, keeping on the theme of college before we jump into career, you know, how do you how do you prefer to learn today? Right, like so, twenty twenty, are you? You're sucking down books, Audible, podcasts, mentors, movies. How, how do you like to learn today? I mean, I think it's all of the above. I, I mean, I certainly try to get out and go to events as much as possible. I okay. think um, just meeting other founders, hearing their stories, um, figuring out the best way to network with people. Um, I try to bring other people together. That's really important to me um, to try to be a connector. And then, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of value that grows out of that. And then just to be a part of that relationship, I think, you know, ultimately lends you a lot of value personally. How do you, how do you mention events? How do you find the good events and not the, the ones that waste your time? That's a good question. Um, I think it's, again, going back to, you know, who do you trust? Um, I Charlie O'Donnell, who's the principal for uh, Brooklyn Bridge VC, has a great newsletter. Uh, weekly newsletter. Um, I think he does a great job curating what's worth and what's not. So I definitely, that's a must read for me. Okay, cool. Um, so before we get into your company, let's do a quick movie montage of your of your corporate life. Oh, okay. Um, also because I know you have a really interesting story in here about uh, an interesting man. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what was that like? What was your career like? Uh, so like I said, I wanted to be in advertising. I got very lucky and got a job as an assistant account executive at Deutsch Advertising, where I was going to be a part of the team behind uh, the IKEA US brand. Okay. This was just to jog everyone's memory right before uh, the big financial collapse and the recession. So it was a working on IKEA was <laughs> a really interesting brand um, in 2008 and nine, whereas obviously a lot of brands were really feeling the pain. I think IKEA rightly so saw this opportunity to emerge as a really sensible option for people that were really counting their dollars at the time. So it was an exciting brand and cultural moment to be a part of. Uh, had a lot of success uh, doing that, learned a ton, and then moved over to another agency called Havas. Uh, spent some time working on the Wreck-It Ben Keyser business. And then, again, going back to the idea of creating relationships and the power of that, the, an amazing creative director that I was working with uh, on that business uh, put me up for an opening on the Dos Equis Most Interesting Man uh, beer account. And then I was able to be a part of that uh campaign from 2011 to 2013. And that was one of those once in a lifetime opportunities to build a brand that was at the heart of yeah. culture yeah. and really what people wanted to talk about, um, both within the alcohol space and then just again in, in kind of advertising in general. And that was right when that whole thing kind of started, right? Yeah, we they just gone national with the campaign the year before. So nice. the TV was getting underway and then I was in charge of a lot of the what's called below the lines. That was the emergency of social media, digital media, doing events, a lot of the 360 retail partnerships. Did you get Did you get to meet the most interesting? Oh, I did. I did. Jonathan is quite a character. Is um, he interesting? He is. He is quite interesting. <laughs> uh, has done. Had did a lot. And, you know, to his credit, really. Again, going back to the idea of creating a brand for yourself. You know, Jonathan understood how um, valuable and how special this role was that he was given, and truly, you know, lived the part day in and day out. So, you know, there's we should give him a lot of credit for making 
um, that character as uh, fascinating. It's real world. And it's real world. Crossover into the exactly. real world. Um, yeah, that's crazy. That's But that's an amazing experience. And I think you had mentioned one point, he, this guy personally in the real world even like became friends with the Obamas. And yeah, yeah. He So so little known fact that, that um, President Obama is a big fan of the campaign. So they happened <laughs> to meet at like a campaign launch event in, in Vermont where the most interesting man had his house and they became good friends. So that was actually an interesting problem for us to try to manage separating the man and this relationship he had built from reality. From reality. And, and obviously, you know, the, the brand, a brand wants to be able to kind of appeal to everyone. So there was some interesting tiptoeing around some new stories. What, what I find interesting do. about that is like, in 2020, it feels like everyone would kill for that, right? That to totally just blur the lines between fiction and reality, and, yeah. and have your thing cross over like that. And you know, you guys did it ahead of its time. Uh, yeah, I wish we could say that we were, you know, we kind of saw the ubiquity of news and the fact that you know all press is good press. But at the time, we were legitimately concerned about how do we make sure to manage the brand away yeah. from this individual's personal yeah. decisions. Very interesting. So. Let's get to the drop. What is the drop? And and give us a little bit of the backstory about how do you go from Havas to you know deciding to, to start this company? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'll, I'll start there, which is um, so I had this amazing experience as part of the team behind the Dos Equis brand, um, but at the same time, you know, I was 26 and feeling like you know is this is this really what I want to do with the rest of my life? And started to feel again, I think hearing my parents' words in my mouth, you know, try to create something of your own. So I decided to go to um, business school um, and be able to kind of focus more and, and sharpen some of the skills that I felt like I needed to be a successful entrepreneur. Uh, so I, I went to Columbia, the full-time program at Columbia Business School, which was an amazing opportunity for me. Um, I actually thought I wanted to do something in retail and fashion, um, but realized that really wasn't where my heart was and that if, you know, to be a successful entrepreneur in the fashion space, I mean, you need to just live and breathe your product. And, and what I realized, what I was actually most excited about was creating this brand, this uh, a brand that, like Dos Equis, was irreverent, spoke its mind, and felt like something completely different than the rest of the category it was playing in. So, you know, really tried to figure out where those opportunities were and um, was on a trip with some friends between two years of business school. Um, we were on a boat in Greece, which was an amazing experience. <laughs> and uh, this was 2014. So I had started to, to drink rosé wine. I was really getting into it. And this was a little bit before the whole rosé all day craze had peaked. <laughs> and so I brought some rosé on board the boat we were on started giving it to some friends, pouring glasses, glassware on a boat is a big no-no. Uh, you know, cups were flying, it was a disaster, we could never find the corkscrew, and a bunch of MBAs on board a boat, we were trying to think of what's a better way to, to solve this problem, if you will, which is, you know, we didn't really want to drink beer, we loved this wine, but the the way that the wine was being presented in these fancy bottles that needed a corkscrew just really wasn't convenient for how we wanted to enjoy it. And so we started thinking about how do you make kind of a better wine product and quickly realized that going back into cans um, and serving wine in a can was a great way of not only making wine more convenient to enjoy, but it really opened up this opportunity to rebrand wine as something that was more accessible, more everyday, that could be presented as an option for kind of more casual drinking. Yeah, it's good timing too, because if you even just look at beer in the last two years, right, this, you're talking about back in 2014, I feel like every craft beer has has no longer in bottles, they're, they're all in cans, and so. It's totally true, yeah. So cans are actually, I mean, it solves two problems. One is it's actually a cheaper way of manufacturing. Um, cans is more, or cheaper cheaper than, than glass, and um, at the same time, uh, it's also uh, a, a better, can be a better packaging option. Uh, there's no oxygen um, getting to it, no sunlight getting to the wine in the can, and that also helps to preserve the wine. So there's a lot of benefits on top of the fact that it's actually more eco-friendly. So because cans are lighter than glass, uh, it requires less fuel to transport them, and cans are more efficiently recycled than glass. So there was a great eco-friendliness story that I was excited to tell as well. Nice. Well, let's take a quick break, uh, and then I want to hear about where the drop is today. We're here with Alexis, and we're talking about the drop, and we'll be right back with more Ambition today. This is Ambition Today. 
What is the single greatest piece of advice Alexis has ever received? Well, you can find out. Find out the answer to this question by joining the Ambition Today A-List back channel. After every episode, we're going longer with each guest and asking them one question. Access her answer and the rest of the recent guests by joining now at siskar.co slash A-List. And let's quickly talk about Audible. Alexis, quick question for you. What is the top book you would recommend to other founders? Oh, okay. Uh, I would think, I just read it, so it might be kind of like top of mind. Yeah. But there's this uh, Mark, uh, Mark. what's his last name? Mark Marson Manson wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read that Am I allowed to swear yeah, on are. this podcast? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and I, you know, his life lessons, I think, are less for entrepreneurs, but I think a lot of his um, advice around you know, having to stay positive and realizing that your problems are not specific to you. These are universal problems. I think it kind of helps put entrepreneurship in a better perspective. Yeah, that's great. And I loved, I love that book as well. If you want to grab a free copy of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, visit audibletrial.com slash ambition today to download and keep any audiobook for free. Thank you. Welcome. And Equity Token. If your company is fundraising or looking to do so in the next six months, then check out equitytoken.co. You can quickly get started by setting up your investment profile and have your company start accepting funds today. The platform generates a shareable link that you can share with investors, and then you can easily close those rounds and bring them in. Mention Ambition Today when you sign up, and you'll jump right to the front of the waitlist. And if you're enjoying this show, then please leave a review in the Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Store. Whatever you use, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Visit Ambition Today online at Syscard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. Welcome back. We are here with Alexis and we're talking about the drop before the break. Alexis, so tell us where is the drop today? Yeah, so I'm excited to share that the drop is uh, a national brand. We Amazing. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have partnered with wonderful distributors, including uh, Southern Glazers, which is the largest distributor in the country. We work with them in close to 20 states, and we sell uh, in small wine stores. We sell in concert venues, and then we actually launched with Walmart uh, last fall. So that's a big that's focus amazing. for us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. How, how has it been, and this is a question I have for my own company, which is I'm starting in a, in a highly regulatory environment. Alcohol seems to be one of those highly regulatory environments. How was it, you know, navigating those those jurisdictions and those waters? It was really hard. Yeah. Uh, it, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, it was definitely what I spent the most amount of my time and, frankly, the most I think, amount of our resources focusing on. That's not an area that you want to mess with. Uh, I would say if you are going to focus, you're, you're going to focus on an adventure that's in a highly regulated space, you want to find uh, the right people to help you navigate that. That's, you know, whether it's, you know, finding the right lawyer, finding for us, we have both a back office compliance company as well as an outside compliance company. Uh, the drop not only sells in retail, but we also sell direct to consumer, which online. is in, online Ooh, at the drop it? It's very tricky. So wanting to make sure that we're doing it correctly, that we have all the right licensing, that we're reporting correctly. Um, so I would say, you know, if, if an entrepreneur is trying to get into that space, that's, that's an area you really want to invest. Okay, cool. Um, well, before we move on, anything else on the drop that, uh, that we should know? Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I would say if, if anyone is looking for some some canned wine or just a, a kind of be a fun option um, to bring to a party or to send to a friend, uh, definitely check out our options. We have three delicious wines uh, that are highly rated by uh, Wine Spectator, and we'd love for you to become a fan of the drop. How can people find the drop? Yeah. So you can go on our website, which is thedropwine.com, and you can either purchase it directly from us and we'll ship it to your door within four days, or you can also go on our store finder and find a retailer near you that uh, sells the drop. Yeah, amazing. I've tried it, uh, I think, at one of the FI sessions. They're, they're amazing. Uh, everyone, go check it out and, and grab some cans. Thanks. So next up, we have a new segment for Season 3. We're calling it The Gauntlet. I'm going to list a series of business categories. Uh, and then based on your own personal experience and what's working for your company right now, just share one tip, process, or tool that, that you love in that category. Okay. Cool? Yeah. All right, here we go. Number one, branding and design. Branding and design. Um, so I've been a, a big fan of Fiverr. I've okay. used it before. 
um, I've found really great people that have been able to execute for us um, very quickly, which is what, for a startup, which is what you need. Nice. Our intro for this podcast is actually made on Fire as well. So. Oh my goodness, there you there go. You go. Uh, go to market slash marketing strategies. Well, I think, is it too early to plug kind of the other thing that I'm focusing on? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just give a little background. Yeah, so exactly. So um, in addition to working on uh, on the drop and growing the drop, um, I have joined the team at hunters.io, which is a freelance uh, sales marketplace, and it really does help uh, startups with their go-to-market strategy. Um, so what it means specifically is if you are a startup and you are looking for sales help or sales intelligence, um, specifically, I think if you have like a B2B business and that's what most CPG companies are, you're trying to sell into other businesses, uh, hunters.io will pair you with professionals that have either worked at or used or have done business with uh, those companies that you're trying to get into the door for and um, give you intelligence on how they like to you know go and find vendors or suppliers and then they can also help make warm introductions to you um, so this is a great opportunity or a great alternative I should say to kind of the traditional hiring a big sales force needing to take on that overhead and not necessarily knowing if they're going to be the right people to help you uh, get into your new market. Okay, cool. I want to talk a little bit more about Hunters in a minute, but let's keep going with the gauntlet. Next up, we have product development. Product development. Hmm. So, I mean, the way that we went about it was uh, a lot of market research, um, talking to our customers, and then, um, you know, I think I would tell Every entrepreneur, I think so many entrepreneurs are just so quick to jump into uh, a final product and just finding one supplier and and making it happen. So we definitely focused a lot on um, trialing different product, doing a lot of stress tests, um, you know, go, literally putting uh, products in the mail, seeing how they did. Um, that's really important. All right. Hiring and onboarding. Um, let's see. How did we hire and onboard? Uh, I focused on LinkedIn. Um and to, in terms of trying to find someone, uh, I don't think there was really any tools I used. So LinkedIn's I a tool that, that yeah, counts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, revenue and accounting. Um, Do you use like QuickBooks? Yeah, we use like QuickBooks. QuickBooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a great, I have. A, I was about to say, my, my bookkeeper in LA is awesome. Okay, that's cool <laughs> And too. she focuses on most of that stuff. All right. Uh, and last but not least, uh, if you did, or maybe you didn't, uh, fundraising. Fundraising, yeah. So uh, let's see. I would say the the tool that we use is Carta. Okay. Um, they're awesome for keeping track of everything, and they also let you do a lot of uh, scenarios and hypotheticals in terms of uh, making sure you understand that if you take on money, you know how that's going to dilute dilute you and your investors, and it really kind of helps think through, you know, is this going to be a good investment or not for us? All right, awesome. So that's the gauntlet. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so. Let's, let's jump back to something you said in there, right? So tell us a little bit about, uh, I mean, you did tell us a little bit about Hunters, but um, why you're excited about this new opportunity uh, and what's going on. Yeah, so I think, you know, so many, um, there are so many tools out there right now for entrepreneurs in order to kind of streamline and outsource a lot of those business practices. But I hadn't really found one for sales. You know, there was a lot of people that were coming to me and saying, oh, yeah, I can get you into XYZ retailer, um, but there was really no way to see if they actually had the connections they did. And so it was a huge, uh, you know, kind of leap of faith as we were taking on salespeople or, or creating relationships and, and partnerships. Um, Hunters.io really kind of appealed to me and I immediately understood the value for it because this is really the first freelance on-demand marketplace where startups can connect with professionals that are looking to make extra money by finding uh, multi like kind of overlapping connections um, and having these professionals help you uh, figure out your market strategy or go to market strategy and help you make uh, warm introductions to start those sales meetings. You know, entrepreneurs are normally the best sales people that they have. You know, they can sell their product the best. They just need that meeting, that opportunity with the right decision maker. And that's exactly what Hunters.io provides to startups. That's awesome. How can if someone listening get involved or... Totally. So uh, our marketplace is live right now, www.hunters with a Z, 
Io, and you can sign up as either a startup uh, to get those warm sales introductions, or you can sign up as a professional uh, to make those introductions. Uh, we only charge startups if we're able to successfully get them that first sales meeting, and then we pay our hunters six hundred and fifty dollars per successful meeting. So that's some real money for what could be as easy as just sending one or two emails. That's awesome. That's great. So. Talking a little bit more about you know life, I guess, and and work, you know work life balance, founder stuff. I want to ask some questions around how you maintain that. So, um, I guess let, let's do this one. I mean, how do you think about work life balance? Right, obviously you have this new gig, but you also have a company, and you know, I'm sure you have a personal life as well. And so, how do you think about you know balance? Yeah, I mean, I think I've realized that you know there's. You know, there's no black and white. Everything mm -hmm. is gray. Uh, work is life and life is work. And if yep. you're not excited about the things that you're working on, you should probably figure out something else to do. But if it feels like work, you're probably not going to be very successful at it. Um, so the, the great thing about the people that I've decided to work with is that they understand that. And so it's really, I think, not necessarily about um, making sure that you're putting in all the hours you can. I think that's going to happen inevitably. But it's about trying to allow yourself um, that balance. Mm -hmm. So that there's going to be some days where you're going to want to work and you end up working 14 hours a day. And there's going to be some days where, you know, you obviously get what needs to get done, mm -hmm. but you know, you want to focus on something else. So I think the most important thing, um, that entrepreneurs can do for themselves is allow themselves that balance. So continuing in this, in this vein, how do you tend to find the edges of your comfort zone? Right. And then how one, how do you recognize you're there? And then two, how do you push past it when you have to? Um, is that something you've come up against or? Um, a little bit. I mean, certainly as an entrepreneur, you know, you're taking on everything in the beginning and there's going to be certain uh, activities or certain responsibilities that you don't feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, a function of making sure that you've given yourself enough time and enough runway to figure it out, you know, not taking on too much. And then I think it's about asking for help. Um, I was so um, surprised and relieved when I started going into my network and saying, hey, I'm, I'm not really great at this. You know, is there someone who could help me there? And finding those people that raise their hand, because I think everyone wants to be a part of something in the beginning. Everyone wants to help create something, even if, they're, even if they don't have an entrepreneurial bone in their body. Everyone wants to help be a part of something big. So it's really been, I think, finding those people that have helped me get past my comfort zone and, and do things I wouldn't be able to do on my own. Yeah, and I think there's something super nuanced there that a lot of people take for granted, which is, you know, people can't help you if they don't know what's going on, right? And so 100%. just putting it out there and not just staying in your own head. And But it requires you to be vulnerable, which is yeah. really hard for an entrepreneur. I think so much of kind of what you hear is that you have to kind of go into every day with, a, with armor on and that everyone's out to get you. And certainly, you know, you need to be smart and you need to protect uh, your company and your IP, but, you know, you, no one's built anything important mm -hmm. by themselves. Yeah. Um, next question. Do you uh, think about legacy at all and, and sort of like meaning of life, anything, anything sort of that in, in any in any way? Um, you know, I, I don't think I've spent that much time thinking about it, but I, I do think kind of going back to what we talked about in the beginning about, you know, my parents telling me and trying to emphasize this idea of building something that's beyond you and something that, you know, isn't just... Um, a, a question of, you know, how many hours you put in the day, but something that kind of stands on its own, you know, definitely I've thought of that. And it's been so rewarding to meet people who have, you know, heard about the job that I've never met before. And this idea of kind of the brand living outside of me has been so rewarding and does make up for those really long days. It's amazing when you sort of like breathe life into something and then to exactly and then watch it grow. Yeah. And it is so exciting when it starts kind of growing outside of you and that, you know, the people that you've brought onto your team or the people that, you know, believe in your story or telling your story on your behalf. I mean, that is total, like that is a total goosebump moment. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, well, I think we're going to switch over to the back channel now. So thank you so much for coming on the pod and sharing your lessons. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, where can people go find out more about you personally, right? Blog, Twitter, website? Yep. Um, so AlexisBeachin.com uh, is my uh, my website. Nice. And I'm on Instagram at Beach in I-N-N-Y-C. 
Nice. I love the Twitter handle. Um, the show notes, which include everything from this episode, will be up on our website. Uh, let's take this over to the A-list for those members. And for everyone else, stay curious. We will see you on the next episode of Ambition Today. Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit siscar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.